if you don't have continuous and reliable power, how can you actually be powering the rest of the digital economy? So it's a huge deal. And of course, there's competition for power because there's crypto, which consumes power, especially Bitcoin, which is becoming the digital money and even electrification of cars. So uh, I, I'd say that it's a policy question. And, and then there's a technology innovation question, because, of course, there's, there's a chance that there can be technological innovation on power delivery. Starting a new plant takes time. Let's say that you know, Washington wants to restart nuclear. There is an enormous lead time required. There's a lot of intellectual property that's been lost because we've decommissioned so much capacity. So um, in the meantime, I do think it does give favor to China because now one of the biggest inputs for AI uh, has much greater availability and arguably potentially lower cost because, as you know, if there's a finite supply of power, um, it's going to get more expensive for users unless the U.S., of course, starts to find partners where they can build a lot of this infrastructure and securely in another country. You know, the U.S. Is, is, can be quite nimble when it needs to be, and I think that's one of the advantages. As you know, we're starting to see some of the uh, ramifications of, of those misguided policies in Europe where, you know, places like Germany and Europe in general might even have power shortages. So I do think that there is, uh, it's going to be very important for this to be executed well. And, and as you know, there's already strains on power today because of, of you know, hot weather and, and the strains on just traditional services. So, you know, perhaps we're going to be in a future world where there's rolling brownouts for everything, but except for AI power. I, I don't think we're late cycle for AI because I don't think that much capital has been invested in a way that's generating questionable returns. I mean, the reality is we can tell NVIDIA is producing chips incredibly profitably because their margins are holding up. And I think the fact that it is, you know, across the $4 trillion level is just a sign of how important AI has become because it, it tells you NVIDIA is probably the most important company in the world. And in terms of how this is intersecting with crypto, um, chat, the chat GPT moment has already happened with crypto because of stable coins. And I think now it's really driving a push for Wall Street into sort of DeFi and crypto, which I think actually sort of plays into AI anyways, because this is a, you know, the idea of decentralized control and blockchains is, I think, going to actually be very complementary to what the AI future. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things the market's probably going to start paying attention to is that AI training has to happen in the real world because a lot of AI training in the U.S. today is social media, internet, published research, uh, and there's not a lot of real world, real world experience. You know, I don't know if that's going to come through meta AR glasses or if it's going to come through robots. I think Tesla has a leg up because they actually have real world uh in, you know, in input of data ingestion because of their cars. But I think once AI is in the real world, it has much better context of like why we say something, where we are at the moment, our expressions or who we're looking at when we say that. So I think that that is actually a huge increase in the amount of information that's going to be ingested. So in some ways, it, it still favors in video. Well, I think it's just that the, the, the amount of in, in, in information that's now going to be inputted and then sort of linked. Uh, in the complexity because now there's a lot more context and a lot more geographic location, color, time of day, the sun, where the shadow was. I don't know. I mean, a lot of in information. I think that actually is a lot more computing power that's required. Well, I mean, I think what China has really demonstrated is that even if you restrict uh, their access to the best chips, they've done a very good job of innovating around that. And they've and their models work really well and, and they're working on much slimmer code. And, and, and probably the fact is China has some advantage on the quality of their AI training because I think they have a lot more real world data that they're ingesting, you know, whether it's from potentially surveilling portions of their population or the general ability for them to actually access information and, and surveil the larger population. Uh, yeah, glad to. Um, Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy have created, I think, a really unique company with Bitcoin because they started by creating a Bitcoin treasury company that has now over 600,000 Bitcoin. Um, I, I, I think that they're correct when they say this is, you know, Bitcoin on beta, and that's why it's more attractive than a Bitcoin ETF. 
what they've done is they've accumulated so much Bitcoin. What is that? Open up beta. Well, it means that if Bitcoin is at 100,000 and let's say Bitcoin doubles, MicroStrategy should actually rise more than that. And one of the questions people ask is, well, why should MicroStrategy trade at a premium to Bitcoin? And the reason I believe it does is that they own so much Bitcoin, it has a sovereign put. 600,000 Bitcoin is so much that if the U.S. government wants to get to a million Bitcoin, they can either buy a million Bitcoin in the open market. And I think if, if, if sellers knew that, they wouldn't sell and Bitcoin's price would rise parabolically. Or they can pay a premium to buy MicroStrategy and get 600,000 Bitcoin. I think it's not just the U.S. government. It's Qatar, the you know, UAE, or any country that wants to accumulate a large position in Bitcoin. And Ethereum, to me, has a very similar dynamic because Ethereum benefits from, its, uh, uh, from using smart contracts. But also Ethereum really is benefiting from this state, you know, the chat GPT, chat, chat GPT moment of stable coins. Stable coins have really exploded because consumers, businesses, and banks are really interested in adopting this. The majority of stable coins are actually transacted on the Ethereum blockchain. And if Treasury Secretary Besson's writing, it goes from a 250 billion market to 2 trillion. That's exponential demand for Ethereum. So we want to be, you know, a uh, an Ethereum treasury company wants to actually accumulate uh, a sizable share of the Ethereum network. And that would actually create, uh, I think, a reflexive benefit um, because if you have a large staking entity, you're securing the network. And I, I think that's the architecture that future banks want to have. You know, when the Goldman and JP Morgans create stable coins, they also want that layer one blockchain to be secure. And I, I can refer to uh, the press release. Uh, that was released um, in conjunction with a, the financing transaction announced yesterday or closing yesterday, which is that if someone buys Ethereum, they're only getting one unit of Ethereum. And if they buy an Ethereum ETF, they're only getting one unit of Ethereum. But an Ethereum treasury company has the ability to grow your holdings of Ethereum per share because one, they can take advantage of capital markets uh, by issuing you know, uh, you know, entities or assets at a premium and acquiring more Ethereum. They earn uh, Ethereum through staking, et cetera. And then there's ability to acquire Ethereum uh, sort of strategically by looking at other assets. So I think that there is this at, at, at a much lower cost because an individual would be borrowing money at a higher cost. But because Ethereum's volatile, uh, an Ethereum treasury company can issue instruments that lower the cost of money. And in fact, like MicroStrategy, for instance, essentially borrows money at zero because of the volatility of Bitcoin. And it turns out Ethereum has twice the volatility of Bitcoin. There's a couple of uh, things I'll share. Mark Newton, who's the head of technical strategy at Fundstrat, uh, has some views on Bitcoin and Ethereum. In the near term, he thinks both have 20% upside. From here, so that would be putting Ethereum closer to 3,300, and he thinks something around 4,500 or 5,000 in the next few months is achievable. That's that's a pretty big move for Ethereum, but I think a perspective someone can have is that realize that Circle trades at around 100 times EBITDA, uh, which I think is it, it's fair because it's scarce uh, and it is one of the best IPOs really in several years. But if you apply that metric to the Layer One Ethereum, you it would imply a value north of ETH per ETH token of over 10,000. So I think it shows you that if the stable coin is, tr is being valued in the market at 100 times, that the underlying layer one, which is really what's securing those transactions, probably is undervalued.